Welcome in everyone to another BDPA Tech and Career Talk. I am our National Tech and Career Talk leader, Devin Jenkins, uh, IT pricing leader for US and Canada at GE Healthcare, also founder, CEO, of Share the Vibes LLC, uh, connecting people through music and technology. So glad to have you all with us. Um, if this is your first time, BDPA is Black Data Processing Associates. Uh, we were established in 1975. We have a focus on teaching computer programming skills and technical skills to our youth. Um, it's also being a forum for career development and networking for IT professionals um, of colors. And our whole mantra is advancing careers from the classroom to the boardroom. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Um, I'll drop links in the chat later today, um, but I do want to remind you about our upcoming conference in Atlanta, August 17th through the 19th at the Western Peachtree Plaza. Uh, so planning is underway and I want to encourage everyone to go out and register for the conference. Be there, you don't wanna miss it. Um, also, if this is your first time, we do have our Tech and Career Talks on the second and fourth Friday of each month. Uh, we have a range of speakers, a range of topics, some people have been in their careers a long time. Uh, some people are just starting out, some entrepreneurs, some are corporate executives. So we get quite the, um, the range here, um, but we want to do something for everyone and everybody. So thank you for joining. I'm excited for today's conversation. Uh, a returning guest, I think we had Ed on. It might've been 2020, I want to say it was. So it was something like that. It was yeah. a COVID time for sure. Yeah, so it yeah. was COVID still wasn't cool. <laughs> oh, man, we yeah. were um, all still pretty much in the house. So I'm glad to have you back, Ed. Um, just first things first. Now, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. Uh, things are going great. Good. Well, let's get into it, Ed. So we're going to have a conversation today. Um, I want to encourage everyone um, as we're talking through this. Um, if you have questions or thoughts, drop them in the chat. Uh, we'll leave time for Q&A towards the end. Um, and if something makes sense to ask, you know, in the middle of the conversation, we'll, we'll jump on it right then. But definitely, um, if you have thoughts, you don't want to forget it, drop it in the chat. We'll definitely circle back to it towards the end of the call. Um, so to kick things off, just Ed, first and foremost, let us know who, who are you? Who is Ed Smith? All right. So uh, Ed Smith is the uh, son of Versi and Lula Smith, who uh, are from... Brookhaven, Mississippi. Uh, so my parents uh, were born during the Depression. Uh, they grew up in Jim Crow South. Uh, my father had uh, dealt with so much uh, trouble uh, as a youth and a teenager, uh, seeing a friend of his being hanged, if you will, and other types of things like that. Uh, he knew he had to get out. Uh, so he joined the army and we came out, he got married, uh, and him and my mother moved to Brooklyn, New York. Uh, luckily for me, they did. So I grew up in Brooklyn, um, in the fifties and sixties, uh, during some turbulent times, as you know, um, but it was an environment that allowed for me to, um, to learn, to discover new things, if you will. One of the things I discovered was electronics that eventually got me into the computer field. So electronics for me back in those days was fixing appliances, doing little odd jobs for people. You know, a lot of people of color, believe it or not, you might believe it, um, had a problem with plugging things in, being afraid that they may spark and blow up. And um, I didn't have that fear, you know, so I got shocked so many times for me. It was like, yeah, I know what it's about, so, you know, but a lot of people didn't want to touch an appliance or anything like that because they were afraid if they tried to fix it, they get shot. So that's how I started really doing a lot of work in the neighborhood. And um, that kept me out of a lot of trouble and eventually got me into uh, a college for electronics, uh, Pace University for computer science and marketing. And then my career from that point on took off. And as you know, uh, it started with my job at a small company called Marbleite, who was a manufacturer of traffic control signals. And at Marbleite, I was one of the engineers who would diagnose problems with those signals before they were shipped. And that was one of the early implementations of microprocessor technology to control traffic signals. Uh, so 
we had the chip guys come into our facilities, talk our executives into using those chips for those traffic signals. And of course they had to have people who could uh, install them and test them in those systems. And they selected me as one of the people to do that. Uh, so I went and got trained uh, on microprocessor technology uh, on the bank role of my company, Marbleite. Uh, and a uh, year or two later, I realized, you know, there's another opportunity for me outside of this with the emerging field of video games and personal computers. And that's when I decided to uh, jump ship, if you will, <laughs> and move over to another company that was actually just starting out in the video game uh, area with one game they had already made called TV Fun, which was a Pong game. And then from there, they decided they wanted to make a uh, cartridge-based color video game. They needed folks who understood microprocessor technology to help them design that game. And that's where I came in. And that was the launch pad of my career. Man, that's uh, quite the gamut <laughs> in, a, yeah. in a peculiar time. Um, in a peculiar just, time. <laughs> no, my, my mom grew up around that same time frame, except she was in South Georgia. So... Uh -huh. uh, a lot of what your family got away from, you know, she she grew up in there. She was in the first integrated class at um, in the high school you know, that I graduated uh -huh. from some years later. But yeah. um, so yeah, um, it's 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 interesting. And you talk you touched on this a little bit. You know, people were afraid to plug appliances in. Like that's you don't yeah. even think about that too much these days, especially with the way electronics have evolved. But that's right. Um, talk a little bit more about the technology scene in the 70s. You know, BDPA was started in 1975. So right. you were kind of like a prime candidate <laughs> for what was going on at the time. What, what was the scene like back then? You know, it's funny because uh, BDPA, I, I actually joined BDPA in, I think, 85, 86. So I didn't even know they were around for 10 years prior to that. Mm. And in 75, during that period, right, that was when well, the microprocessor industry was just taking off. It just started, right? You had uh, Intel coming out with their chips, Motorola coming out with their chips. Everybody was making the chipsets, and then they were trying to figure out what to do with them, right? I mean, they actually had this technology, and it took a while before you saw the first real offshoot of that technology start to happen. So it started with the processor for some small things, as you know, like calculators and uh, adding machines. And then they said, okay, we can now take that compute power to the next level, which is what they did. And we did the video gaming stuff. And that was pretty much in parallel with the personal computer drive that was taking place as well. So we have both things going on, right? And even at APF, when I went to that company for video games, they already had their bread box personal computer, as we call it. So they plugged a microprocessor chip into a box had switches on it that you would use to do some rudimentary programming. Mm. So the early days was like that, right? I mean, we were all just learning stuff, trying to figure out how to best use this new technology. And um, we started out very small. Like I said, we were doing switch-based programming at first, and then we moved to the real stuff, which was uh, take the chipset and use a programming environment to develop ROMs and PROMs that would become the heart and soul of a computer or a video game. So we went through that entire process and that was the early stages of technology, at least for me. And again, I started in 75, yeah, 75. When BDPA was first uh, introduced, I started my career at 21 years old doing that type of work. Um, but I saw this, this growth of this technology over the years from that first point when I was working on the video game to the point we're at today where we're talking about AI and VR. We, we didn't think about that back in those days. In those days, we wanted to just advance the capabilities of the microprocessor so we could do more with it. And that had to do with more about gaming and business applications that you wanted to run where memory requirements were a big thing. You know, back in the first start of the video game industry, for those folks who are uh, somewhat younger, 
we were talking about eight bit systems, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about 8K of memory. That's eight mm -hmm. kilobytes of memory, guys, right? <laughs> we're talking about such a small piece that we had to work around just to write these games that were pretty nice games at the time, right? We actually took some kids off the street because they were having more fun playing the games than they would doing something that was not quite right, you know? All right. So we did that and um, we saw the industry just move along in a certain direction. And as you know, the video gaming industry took a dive in the eighties. Um, if you didn't know, now you do, but, but that's exactly what happened. The gaming industry, uh, thanks to some bad decisions by some of the bigger players in that space, like Atari, uh, lost market share, lost their business. Uh, companies like Sega, was just starting to come out and reverse engineered the Atari to come up with their own video games. And over time, they developed their own console. But it took another four or five years before the industry started to come back because of Sega, because of Sony, because of Microsoft, developing their own video gaming systems outside of what Atari started, what APF started, and Coleco started, Magnavox and all these other companies that you don't hear of anymore. And now you have like a big three gaming environment where they pretty much have the lion's share of the market for uh, console-based video games. Oh man. So you, so you learn in microprocessing, you worked on the traffic controller lights, um, where at the time, you know, we're dealing with eight kilobytes of, of memory and you know, I'm, I'm trying to, get space on my phone and I got like 128 gigs on there now. So. Gigs of memory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it just speaks to the the difference of the uh the processing power and just kind of how things were. You know, we we look some some 50 years ago now we talk about the 70s, which is it's crazy to say it out loud. Um so so you talked a bit about how you got into video gaming, some of the the things you went through that experience. Um let's talk, yeah. let's talk a little bit specifically um, about your role um, in one of those first video game systems. Um, what was it called? What did it do? Kind of what was what was the kind of specific experience around your video game pioneering? Okay, yeah, good question. So um, when I came to APF Electronics, um, as I mentioned, they already had the Pong-based video game. Um, I can recall, I think it was probably at the company no more than a week when we all got into a room and we started to chalkboard. I said chalk because we didn't have whiteboards. We started to chalkboard out the design for this new uh, color-based video game. Uh, and since I had a lot of experience with using uh, the uh, I.O. ports for the microprocessor, because if you think about what traffic control is, it's mostly controlling I.O., turning on and off signals as you will. So I had a lot of experience using I.O. type technology on the chipsets. So they knew that when they hired me. And um, my role was defined as being the guy that would do most of the IO on that uh, video game. So we had the, and I, by the way, I did not just some of the design work, but I built the prototypes. I wrote up the schematics. I communicated with folks offshore because we had some folks doing work there as well. That's where they did all of the the casing and everything for the games and to develop the uh, circuit boards for the games. They did all of that. But in the US, uh, I would do design for the IO and the IO included cartridge slots and included the joysticks uh, and included anything that had to do with, you know, uh, communicating directly with that video game. Uh, the TV that you connected it to, all of those things is what I did. And then we had programmers who wrote the games, right? And then another job of mine, because the programmers would write the games. This was a small company, by the way. I mean, we're only talking about maybe six or seven people in this company that did this. Mm. So everybody had multiple roles. It's not like today where you can have one person that does this, one person. You know, you got a guy who can get paid or a lady who can get paid $100,000 a year just playing a video game to make sure there's no bugs. I had to do that as one of my jobs back in the day at APF. And they would come to me and ask me what level I was on. Uh, to make sure I got to the highest level because they did not want to ship out a, a cartridge unless they were sure there were no bugs going up to the highest level. So that took up some time. Um, but most of it was making sure that the design itself was uh, 
accurate, that the testing we did and the prototyping we did uh, met the design criteria. Uh, and once we got the video game out into the marketplace, uh, that's where the fun started taking off because it really was a game that people did like to play. And one of our biggest suppliers for that game was Sears and Montgomery Ward at the time. Matt. <laughs> that's that's quite the story um and to think there's a company you know seven people <laughs> making seven this people. at a time where you know yeah. that there weren't too many um there weren't too many predecessors for this <laughs> you know like no. you, you're figuring it out on the go and you know, I, I can imagine you know, which you know kind of one of the questions i want to get into is just some of the challenges you face but now i can imagine you know this just being a crazy idea to investors or um yeah. trying to get this in the market you know, it's just like people just want to sit around and play on a, a game, yes. like make it make sense. <laughs> uh, so uh, so maybe, maybe talk a little bit about that. So so what ended up happening to this game? I think it was the MP1000, which turned into the imagination machine. Um, no, what what happened to the game, uh, for one? Because I don't think I saw it you know, when I was born. Um, no. But then also, <laughs> what were some of the biggest challenges you faced while you were going through you know, this whole experience of, of building a video game? Yeah, Devin. So, um... Again, when we were working on that video game, as I mentioned, it was, you know, in the mid 70s, uh, you still had a lot of uh, challenges living in uh, Brooklyn uh, at that time. And, um, you know, where I lived at in Brooklyn, as compared to my contemporaries at APF, was a stark difference, you know. So I'm going on the train back to the hood in Brooklyn, uh, which was pretty much, I wouldn't say it was the projects because I had just gotten out of the projects with my wife at the time, but we were living dirt cheap. We weren't making a lot of money. And I recall you know, going to work and some of the folks there having chats about getting a new car and buying a new house and mowing the lawn and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm doing exactly the same work they're doing. And they're telling me all of these great stories about their life. And I'm sitting over here getting back on the train, going back to the hood, and then thinking about going back to work the next day to hear the same stories. Not to mention the fact you go back to the hood and you have to watch your back and make sure that nobody's, you know, rolling up on you uh, to mug you. And I've been mugged and I've gone back to work, you know, and just had to do my job. There was nobody I could actually say, you know, this is what happened and, you know, get some support. I had no support. So I had to deal with that. I had to deal with uh, traffic strikes. They had a uh, you know a transit strike. I had to walk to work from Brooklyn. Uh, these guys would drive their cars into work, right? So there was a lot of that challenge that I had to deal with while sitting in front of my uh, station, trying to do technical work, trying to get my mind back into what I was there for and trying to take it off of what I just came from. So that was a big challenge for a person who was young, who was doing a lot of leading edge stuff. And I knew it was leading edge stuff, um, but I couldn't help to think about what was going on with myself and my family every time I went home. Mm. And, you know, and it goes back to the, the time period you know, yeah. that, that, that you were in. Um, and and looking at the the game itself, so you're dealing with kind of the pressures of life and society at this time. Um, from a business perspective, what were some of the challenges of getting this game to market? You know, around this time. Yeah, the um, the key reason that we actually developed the MP1000 video game. It had nine, ten cartridges. It had a built-in game as well. Rocket Patrol, it was called. But the key impetus for de designing that video game was uh, the companies like uh, Coleco and Magnavox and Atari uh, introducing video games. And the company had already gotten the, the Pong game out. So the business decision around Pong was very simple because all they had to do was take a chip, put it into a box, put some controllers on it and have it uh, manufactured offshore and then deliver it to our distributors. And as I said, Sears was our biggest distributor. So when the other games came out, the color-based video games came out, the business decision was to compete with those firms and develop our own 
color-based video game with the support of our main distributor, who is Sears. So our banks agreed, they put the bill for us to go ahead and do the work to design the video game. And the video game sold relatively well. And when I say relatively well, you know, back in the 70s, we were selling like a couple of hundred thousand units. We weren't selling millions of units, but we were selling a good share of the marketplace. So the, um, the folks at Sears came to us with a story that they heard from Atari about Atari adding a console unit to their video game to turn it into a personal computer. So when we heard about this, and I read about this because I was reading all of the publications at the time, I knew that that capability was there. Uh, so we got back together and we hunkered down and we said, okay, we're going to go ahead and beat them to the market. And we're going to design our own personal computer based on the MP1000 video game. Mm -hmm. uh, the banks were hesitant to foot the bill for that, but our executives con convinced them to do so. Mm -hmm. So we were working on a tight type string. I can tell you every dime was, you know, being spent just to make this thing happen. So again, since I had the IO experience, one of the key things I did was to develop the interface between the video game and the console, and then make sure that we designed the layout so that it was uh, computer-like, if you will. So it had a computer layout similar to what an, a, an Apple had at the time, except we had our game sitting on top. And we had a tape deck in the, in the computer for data storage and for uh, education, um, and that was it, right? So we would actually add an adapter unit to it so that you can plug in a modem, printer ports, and all of these things were optional, as you know, back in the day. Nothing was built in as it is today. So you had all these options as well. And we came out with that box and we called it the Imagination Machine. It was indeed a hybrid video game, personal computer. A person could actually buy the video game, the MP1000, they can play the games, and later on they can decide, well, you know what? I think I'll buy a personal computer. And all they had to do was buy our console, attach it to that video game, and they could run some of the same applications as any other personal computer could at that time, including word processing, spreadsheets, database. We were able to do that with this unit. The business problem was, no one wanted to buy a hybrid video game, personal computer at that time. Atari pulled out, they never de de developed their own. We were the only ones, and even today, it's the only system on the market that is a hybrid video game, personal computer, the only one. And I was one of the people that helped design that only hybrid system. So it may not have sold as much as we had hoped. And one of the reasons it didn't sell, as I mentioned earlier, folks didn't catch that, it had a tape drive built into it during the time when floppy disk drives were just being introduced. So we had built a system that was already op obsolete when it hit the marketplace. Mm. That was our biggest business mistake. And by the way, guys like me in engineering, myself and the two other engineers, we did not want that tape deck built into that box. <laughs> but the business people, the executives said, look, this is not going to be something that you're going to use to compete against Apple and Radio Shack and all of these other companies that had personal computers. This is a family computer. And if we're gonna develop a family computer, we have to build things in that they can use right out of the box. That was their justification. Hmm. But sure enough, families even at that time were not buying personal computers with tape drives in it. They were buying them with floppy disk drives in them. So that uh, sort of uh, obsolescence our system we still sold a few hundred thousand units but nothing like we should have had that tape deck not been built in and then we tried to re-engineer it by taking out the video game and putting it right into the console and called that the imagination machine too but what did we do we kept the tape deck <laughs> so, so a lot of those things is why you really haven't heard about this as you have heard about other computers like Apple and Atari and et cetera. It's because we just made some really bad business decisions with that system. And by mm -hmm. the time we got to shipping the Imagination Machine 2, the bank said, we're not giving you any more money. 
So we had to, we just had the, the first few units of the Imagination Machine 2 ship, and we had to get the manufacturing offshore going, but we had to put money into it, and the banks would not give us the money, and we ran out of money. And APF just, I think within a year or two, went out of business. So that was in 80, 83, 84. So I was there from 75 to 82, 83. Yeah, and they were just out of business, just like that, which of course put me in a precarious position because that was probably the best job that I had. Mm -hmm. I was doing work that was unbelievable. I didn't care if I was spending 12 hours you know, at my engineering desk, and I did. We spent a lot of late hours because we had deadlines we had to meet. We had to get our systems to the different uh, technology shows at the time. Computer electronics show was probably the biggest one at that time. So there was a lot of pressures on us to get things done. Um, and I was proud to do that level of work at APF. And that's when, unfortunately, the gaming industry had died. Personal computing was just taking off. And I had to make a decision as to what I wanted to do with my career post APF. But my time at APF was indeed the best time of my life. And that's, I, I, and I can imagine, um, even despite the challenges, I just you know a lot, yeah. of, a lot of times, some of the most challenging times you've been through turn out to be the most memorable. So exactly. I can imagine that just being a, a exactly. kind of a once in a lifetime type of experience. Um, yeah. But with, with the, with APF, you know, kind of kind of losing out on funding and, and going downhill, I you know it's a, it's part of the transition for you. So what did you do next? Yeah. So, you know, one of the one of the nice things about working at uh, APF is I did have a chance to go to these different uh, technology shows uh, and meet a number of different people, as well as when we did the imagination machine. You know, we would I was one of the folks since I knew the compute part of it. Our salespeople did not. They couldn't understand RAM or RAW or any of that. So I had to actually go out on the road with them to help promote the imagination machine. So I met up with a lot of the different uh, computer dealers during that time. Uh, you had bike computer systems. You had the computer factory. You had a uh, computer room. You had all of these different computer uh, resellers that were out there. And we were pushing our system to them. So when APF went down, uh, one of the resellers introduced me to uh, his counterpart, who was the marketing person at Apple. And, uh, you know, back then, we, we, we didn't have job boards, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted to find some work, uh, you, have to, you had to go through either like a technology publication and in the back pages, you would see job postings, or you had to know somebody. Uh, and luckily, I met up with this person. And there was a job opening for a territory manager for Apple Computer in the upstate New York Territory, managing Apple dealerships, you know, helping them to promote the Apple II at that time, uh, which I knew very well because I reversed engineered it to come up with some <laughs> of the design work we did for the imagination machine. But that was my next role. My next role was doing that type of work for Apple um, in the upstate New York Territory. So, I, And this was one of the wonderful things that happened in my life and my family's life. And uh, it gave us the opportunity to move out of Brooklyn to Albany, New York, which was mm -hmm. the central location, you know, based on the territory I had. So that was the, the first time that we uh, were able to leave that environment and go to an environment that seemed to be more uh, in line with, you know, what our hopes and dreams were all about. So that was the next move. It was Apple. And then from Apple, it was, uh, you know, so Apple had their own problems at the time, right? <laughs> Folks don't know this. You know, if you go back into the uh, early 80s, um, I think I joined Apple in 82, 83, somewhere in that neighborhood. So the Apple II was the, the, the flagship PC for anyone at the time, right? They had the spreadsheet, VisiCalc, they had the database DB2, uh, they had the word processing, which was uh, WordStar, right? These names may sound unfamiliar to you, but if you go do some Googling, you'll find out these were the first applications for the Apple II. And that's what made that computer so powerful. 
It wasn't the box. It was what you put into the box that gave it the power. And that's why people were buying that computer, especially businesses, writers, right? Businesses with databases, writers to be authors, uh, spreadsheets for accountants. That's what was selling at the time. And Apple was doing a wonderful job. And I was happy to be there with Apple during that time. But as I said, they ran into some problems on their own because they decided that the Apple II could be better. And in making it better, they actually made it worse because mm -hmm. they, they came out with the Apple III. And as a historian in this area, when we talk about the history of personal computers and me being an employee at Apple, and I'm trying to promote this Apple III, I can tell you it was the worst computer I had ever seen in my life, <laughs> literally. I mean, it was even hard to get it booted up so that it would run. And the operating system, it was called Apple Sauce. We called it Apple Sauce. I mean, it was just <laughs> horrendous. So the Apple III really never took off. Apple started losing money. They put more money into another system that didn't take off either. That was the Apple Lisa, right? So again, it was a big box, limited memory, limited storage, and people were just not buying it. But it was the introduction of the first graphical user PC, mm -hmm. right? So Apple was nosediving as far as money was concerned. It had laid people off. And I was one of the people that got laid off because... They just couldn't sustain what they were trying to do. There's a whole story about what Apple did at that time. I can give you commentary and opinions, but we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> but I can tell you that what Apple did with that, those systems was the biggest mistake they ever made as far as a company was concerned, but they were able to hold on to enough cash to retrench and get it right. And that was the get it right part was the Mac the Apple Macintosh, but when that first came out, that could do very little as well. 128K of memory, small screen, a lot of disk swapping just to get things, applications up and running. It took them two or three years before the Macintosh took off. And by the way, during all of this time, IBM was just cleaning their clock. Okay? <laughs> I mean, literally cleaning their clock. IBM just said, okay, we see what Apple did with the Apple II, open architecture, slot, you can plug cars into it. And IBM just did the same thing. They just used a different operating system and they had all these third party companies come out with all of these additions to the IBM PC to make it the personal computer of the 80s and 90s. And there Man. you have it. <laughs> and there's your history lesson for today. <laughs> that, that, yeah, but after Apple, it was mostly in business development, strategic okay. alliances, which, which is really what I started to do. Because again, you know, you're talking about an industry that was just starting out. The, the personal computer industry in the 80s was brand new. Mm -hmm. Very few people understood it. Very few people knew how to engage and how to integrate these things together. And that's exactly what I did. I was able to go out to third party companies, to individual people, to talk to them about how to make these things better by adding different functionalities into the existing environment. And that is that knowledge that took me to, you know, working at Novell and computer networking and integrating those networking systems. And then in a company like Infosys, which was a consulting company to advise people on how to do these things. So that's how my career really started to change from the engineering environment um, to what it was when I left the industry, which was mostly around uh, technology integration. And that was a, that's a wonderful thing too, right? Because uh, in my career, I've probably touched on almost every technology you can think of. Mm. You don't, you know, you name it in business, they used it. And if, as you know, as a, as an alliances person, you're integrating with all of these technologies. So it was a wonderful ride. Oh man. So, so yeah. are you retired now? What keeps you busy today? You know, um, first of all, the word retired, that's a, that's a bothersome word for me. <laughs> I think folks these days, I'm going to say I'm reimagining, okay. right? Because you cannot say you're re retired to me means I'm not doing anything anymore. And that's just not the fact, right? <laughs> so I'm just reimagining what I'm doing now. And I'm doing some things that are different. I wrote the book, Imagine That. It's on Amazon if you want to get it. Ed Smith, Imagine That. Uh, so I do a lot of talks to high schools, to universities, to organizations like BDPA. 
Uh, I get on the road sometimes and I do these uh, presentations to a lot of different corporations uh, and letting them know that diversity is a very important thing uh, for their business. And when you talk about diversity, and I say this a lot because when you use the term diversity, it can be uh, misunderstood. And I keep telling them, I'm talking about diversity for African-Americans. I'm not talking about diversity for women. And if you look at some of the folks who are chief diversity officers of their corporations, they will throw out these reports and say, we're a diverse company. Look at how many women we've hired, right? That's not diversity, at least not in my terms. In their terms, they think they're doing the right thing because frankly, their argument is, we would love to hire more African-Americans, but we just can't find them. Well, I don't think that's true. I think you're not looking hard enough, right? You're not looking in the areas that they're at to go out and recruit them. And you can't use the same methods to recruit them. Uh, and you have to be able to not just recruit them, but put in place uh, facilities by which they can be educated and not have them have to get on a bus and a train and a boat to finally get to a place where they can learn something, right? So. Thankfully, technology has changed that because we can now just go online. And if you're, if you're willing and if you're able, you can learn as much as you want at any time. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Um, I, I have one more question I want to ask and then I'm going to open the floor. I see we have a question in the chat and we have a hand raised um, on the call. So T, I do see you. And then, um, and I don't, I'm not sure if your name is Kai or Kay, but I, I'll let you correct me as soon as we finish this one. Um, but so, you know, you, so you, you were here at the inception of video games. We're dealing with you know, eight, ki eight kilobytes of memory. Um, you know, then we, we kind of advanced into having some cartridges and tape decks and personal computers. And I came along, um, I was born in 93. So when I came along, you okay. had the Sega Genesis and the PlayStation yes. Nintendo 64. So you know, definitely cartridge heavy. We had down the memory cards that might have 25 megabytes on it or something. Um, yeah. And then you know, now e-gaming and esports is the big thing. It's a, it's oh, a yeah. huge thing. I think we plan to have some e-gaming things at the conference this year, uh, but it's mostly digital now. You can, as long yeah. as you got internet, you can play with anybody anywhere around the world. Sure. Um, I know people who are making good money streaming, just playing video games on Twitch, um, Twitch ma yeah. making making good money. I'm yeah. um, doing it. Um, no, we were both at, at the Blessing Technology Conference in Orlando and they had a Madden God tournament, uh, which seemed like underground battle rap to me, but it was Madden. <laughs> like it was crazy. It had a BSP section and bars and everything. Yeah. Uh, so just, no, what, what are your thoughts on the evolution of gaming uh, coming from the cartridges, very low memory to esports, where it's a whole business venture at this point? Um, and it looks completely different now that everything's digital. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, first of all, the gaming industry, thankfully, has matured to where it is today. Uh, and when you talk about Twitch, I love seeing, you know, you know, you can just see these guys just going through their motions. You can learn a lot just how to play the games by watching Twitch. And But the, the entire eSports space today um, is just now growing. It's not where it's going to be, but it's just now growing because you have all of the uh, facilities by which you can do virtual type stuff. Uh, with e-gaming, uh, you have the bandwidth by which you can have multiple players uh, compete against each other. And that's what e-gaming is all about. It's about competition. It's about sitting there and learning enough about your gaming skills to be able to compete against others who are also pretty good. You know, and you don't want to get into an e-gaming environment and not do your homework, right? You have to know pretty much the game and you have to know how to play it. You have to know how to compete against these folks. So it's almost as if you have this new environment of a multiverse, you know? So it's your environment, your world, you're there with your competitors or with your allies and you're playing these games in a space by which you are immense into that space until the game is over or until you just give up or you lose or whatever. But it's taking people again out of that criminal environment out of that criminal mind putting them into a space into a room by which they can just enjoy themselves with their peers by playing games that are competitive and gives them a lot of opportunities to do other things in that space but by the way i'm not for any e-gamings that has to do with violence and i know there's a lot of that out there 
but that that was not the, that is not the space I'm talking about. I, I'm, I'm not against. I'm not for uh, the the violent e games, and I know they're out there, so I don't watch those. Okay, and do do you still play today? Oh yeah, I, I you know I have an Xbox, um, I have a Wii, <laughs> uh, so I yes I do play, but most of the most of the games I play today, I'll be honest with you, are more. Uh, luminant games more mind games like uh chess or air traffic control or you know flight simulator and stuff like that you know so that's that's where my head is today but i still play <laughs> cool cool well well thank, thanks for sharing with us ed uh, we do have a few questions that we'll open up before to any others as well so uh I, i'm going to guess kai and i'll let you correct me uh but but kai you've had a question in the chat for a while now so uh do you want to come off mute and ask your question or would you like me to ask it for you okay i'll go ahead and ask it for you then okay um and and, and let me know is, is kai how you pronounce your name give me a yes or no in the chat because <laughs> i want to make sure i'm saying your name right so thank you all right so kai jc asked were you programming games in machine language or did you have to make developer tools to help that's a very good question so yes and yes so some of the games were actually machine code uh and those were mainly not the games that we put in the cartridge the cartridge games we used a motorola development environment to write the cartridge-based games. But there's a game that's built into the MP1000 called Rocket Patrol. We wrote that game with machine language. And just to test out the MP1000 video game, a lot of the things I did was write these small games just to test the system to make sure that the processor was doing what it's supposed to with all the IO ports uh, and uh, memory allocations. Uh, so I would write some just quick games just to test out uh, the machine, you know, game like I wrote a game called Flash, if you will, right? So you hit a number on the joystick or two and it disappears. I'm sorry, the number would pop up on the screen and then you would repeat that number on your joystick. And then the number would pop up to a number of like five characters, you repeat it, 12 characters, remember it, repeat it. You can get up to 20 or 30 characters before you say, I can't remember all those numbers. But it tested the system to show you that it would do an output on the screen and then it waited for an input and check to see if you've done it correctly. And that was a really small type of game that we did just to test out the systems. So it was both machine language and the Motorola development environment was called the Exorciser. Thanks for that question, Kai. Um, and thank you for explaining that, Ed. Uh, T, I see your hand. We will come to you next. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep, hear you. Oh, hi. Hi, Ed. Um, Devin, thank you so much for putting this on. Boy, I go way back with you, Ed. I have a bachelor's, uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering from Tuskegee University and a master's from um, University of California. And I started out, you know, developing environmental sensing um, devices and everything. But basically my question, I, and I'm excited that you're doing outreach with children and trying to get more, you know, people interested in uh, tech, various technologies. Um, I wanted to just kind of not veer off of the gaming, but ask about um, the theory of personal computers. With all of the way that the software now is being developed and pushed out into the cloud, and if you have like a, a, a Windows-based machine, you see that Microsoft does CI/CD on your your machine, where they can shut down <laughs> things while you're actually program or working on something. And it seems like everything is moving out to the cloud and away from your own personal computer. They're even changing the nomenclature to you know just your laptop or what have you. Um, what are you, without, you know, thinking of anything just sinister or anything, what's, what's going on with this evolution, you know, <laughs> where people are not really having the, the control of their own computer anymore? And who knows what happens when they do an update? You know, you could send data back and forth um, very rapidly yeah. these days. Yeah. All right. So here's, here's the answer to that question. And I got to give you another history lesson just to make sure you understand where we are today with the cloud. Um, in the 60s, through the 70s and even the 80s, the only way people would use technologies prior to the personal computer 
was to log on to an IBM mainframe with a green screen terminal and you were tethered to that system. You had to get uh, access to that system, not to everything, but only to the things that you wanted to do. You had to request that access as a business person, as a user, and you would be able to do an accounting piece here, load up some data over there, but you never had full control of that IBM mainframe environment. And it was, as I said, tethered. So everything was connected to a wire. Today, and by the way, uh, the term we used back then for that was called client server computing. Uh, that's exactly what cloud is today, right? So now instead of having a green screen, you have a laptop or any other device that you choose to use to access a backend system. It's not a mainframe, but it's still a backend system that gives you your applications and your data upon request. So now they call it cloud, they call it SaaS, they call it this, they call it that. It's still client server computing. And that's exactly what businesses want. They want to be able to control your environment and not let you go out and do things you want to do on your own. The early days of personal computers, when you had these accountants doing their own spreadsheets, the businesses hated that, right? Because the accountant was now in control of the data and not the business. So that's why you have the environment now with the cloud. It's really for businesses to control your environment. That's not good. <laughs> no, that, that's just the reality, you know? Right. Thank you for your input. Thanks for that question, T. Are there other questions out there? The floor is open. Questions or comments? I want to make sure we don't have anybody speaking on mute. Okay. All right, hearing now, well, Ed, any uh, closing thoughts or comments from you? Uh, yeah, you know, first of all, this has been a great conversation. I'm glad that I'm still able to. Uh, both share my story as well as some history about the video gaming and the personal computer industry. Um, I, I would say that if I had any passing thoughts, it would be um, you folks uh, are in a wonderful position to take advantage of all of the new technologies that are now coming out into the marketplace. Uh, and my only suggestion would be to, you know, don't don't be uh, pigeonholed into one thing or in your environment, look at areas that are really um, bleeding edge, not leading edge, bleeding edge. Try to be on top of what you see as far as technology is concerned, uh, because that's how you become the gurus that people keep talking about. Gurus are not people who just learn something and do the work. Gurus are people who adopt something that's new and then tell people how it's used. Thank you for that, Ed. Um, and if you look in the chat, and T, I'm not sure if you have access to the chat or not. Um, I do. Um, but um, I put Ed's LinkedIn link um, in the chat. So definitely uh, connect with Ed on LinkedIn uh, yep. to continue the conversation. I, I think I see some links for his book out there um, if you want to cool. check that out. Um, but Ed, if there's some other, maybe like a phone number or anything like that, or email, website, um, feel free to put that in the chat as well. Um, I've yep. also, put the link for our conference out there for BDPA Con 23. Uh, so please go register, plan to attend in Atlanta this year. It will be a great time. And I've also put the link for our Tech and Career Talk site. I'm in the chat as well, which is bdpa.org backslash tech in career talks. Um, but we uh, have our recordings out there. So this session will be out there as well as all of our previous tech talks. And they're also on our, on our YouTube channel, National BDPA. So go out there, subscribe, like everything the influencers say, press the button, <laughs> um, go out there and subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, to check out the Tech and Career Talks as well as the other content uh, that BDPA has out there. Um, I know T says she does not use LinkedIn, but would like to invite you to a STEM meeting, Ed. Um, what STEM email address? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me put my email in the chat as well. Okay, so Ed will put his email in the chat, and T, please reach out and connect that way. 
Uh, we see our VP of operations, Timothy Joyner. Thank you for joining, Timothy. Any announcements Timothy. or anything you would like to say? Now, keep up the great work. This is a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for bringing in your expertise, Ed. The history, expertise, and context has been tremendous. I'm sure the audience got a lot out of it. And those who weren't here, just like you said, Devin, go back to the archives, rewatch this, learn it. And that way you too can become a guru, like Ed said. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Anything else from anyone before we wrap up for the day? All right. Well, thank you all for joining. If all hearts and minds are clear, uh, be safe, stay blessed. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. Peace and love, folks.